Hello everybody, my name is Foxy Blue and I'm going to be reading you a short story called Flesh and the Mirror by Angela Carter from her collection Burning Your Boats. It was midnight. I chose my times and set my scenes with the precision of a born artiste. Hadn't I gone 8,000 miles to find a climate with enough anguish and hysteria in it to satisfy me? I had arrived back in Yokohama that evening from a visit to England and nobody met me, although I expected him. So I took the train to Tokyo, half an hour's journey. First, I was angry, but the poignancy of my own situation overcame me, and then I was sad. To return to the one you love and find him absent. My heart used to jump like Pavlov's dogs at the prospect of such a treat. I was positively salivated at the suggestion of unpleasure. I was sure that that was real life. I'm told I always look lonely when I'm alone. That is because when I was an intolerable adolescent, I learned to sit with my coat collar turned up in a lonely way so that people would talk to me. And I can't drop the habit even now, though now it's only a habit and I realize a predatory habit. It was midnight and I was crying bitterly as I walked under the artificial cherry blossom with which they decorate the lamp standards from April to September. They do that so the pleasure quarters will have to look of a continuous carnival, no matter what ripples of agitation disturb the never ceasing, endless, circulating, quiet, gentle, melancholy crowds who throng the wet web of alleys under a false ceiling of umbrellas. All looked as desolate as Mardi Gras. I was searching among a multitude of unknown faces for the face of the one I loved while the warm, thick, heavy rain of summer greased the dark surfaces of the streets until, after a while, they began to gleam like sleek fur of seals just risen from the bottom of the sea. The crowds lapped around me like waves full of eyes until I felt that I was walking through an ocean whose speechless and gesticulating inhabitants, like those of whom medieval philosophers peopled the countries of the deep, were methodical inversions or mirror images of the dwellers on dry land. And I moved through these expressionist perspectives in my black dress, as though I was the creator of all and of myself too, in a black dress, in love, crying, walking through the city in the third person singular, my own heroine, as though the world stretched out from my eye like spokes from a sensitised hub that galvanised all to life when I looked at it. I think I know now what I was trying to do. I was trying to subdue the city by turning it into a projection of my own growing pains. <laughs> what solipsistic arrogance. The city, the largest city in the world, the city designed to suit not one of my European expectations. This city presents the foreigner with a mode of life that seems to him to have the enigmatic transparency, the indecipherable clarity of dream. And it is a dream he could himself never have dreamed. The stranger, the foreigner, thinks he is control, but he has been precipitated into somebody else's dream. You never know what will happen in Tokyo. Anything can happen. I have been attracted to the city first, because I suspected it contained enormous histrionic resources. I was always rummaging in the dressing up box of the heart for suitable appearances to adopt in the city. That was the way I maintained my defences for, at that time, I always used to suffer a great deal if I let myself get too close to reality, since the definitive world of the everyday, with its hard edges and harsh light, did not have enough residence to echo the demands I made upon experience. It was as if I never experienced experience as experience. Living never lived up to the expectations I had of it. The Bovary syndrome. I was always imagining other things that could have been happening instead. And so I always felt cheated, always dissatisfied. Always dissatisfied, even if, like a perfect heroine, I wandered, weeping, on a forlorn quest for a lost lover through the aromatic labyrinth of allies, and wasn't I in Asia? Asia! But 
Even though I lived there, it always seemed far away from me. It was as if there were glass between me and the world. But I could see myself perfectly well on the other side of the glass. There I was, walking up and down, eating meals, having conversations, in love, indifferent, and so on. But all the time I was pulling the strings of my own puppet. It was this puppet who was moving about on the other side of the glass. And I eyed the most marvellous adventurers, with the bored eye of the agent with the cigar, watching another audition. I tapped out the ash and asked of events, what else can you do? So I attempted to rebuild the city according to the blueprint in my imagination, as a backdrop to the plays in my puppet theatre, but it sternly refused to be so rebuilt. I was only imagining it had been so rebuilt. On the night I came back to it, however hard I looked for the one I love, she could not find him anywhere, and the city delivered her into the hands of a perfect stranger who fell into step beside her and asked why she was crying. She went with him to an unambiguous hotel with a mirror on the ceiling and lascivious black lace draped round a palpably illicit bed. His eyes were shaped like sequins. All night long, a thin, pale, sickle moon with a single star pendant at its nether top, floated upon the rain that pitter-pattered against the windows, and there was a clockwork whirring of cicadas. From time to time, the wind bell dangling from the eaves let out an exquisitely mournful tinkle. None of the lyrical eroticism of this sweet, sad, moon night of summer rain had been within my expectations. I had half expected he would strangle me. My sensibility wilted, under the burden of response. My sensibility foundered under the assault of my senses. My imagination had been preempted. The room was a box of oiled paper full of the echoes of the rain. After the light was out, as we lay together, I could still see the single shape of our embrace in the mirror above me, a marvellously unexpected conjunction cast at random by the enigmatic kaleidoscope of the city. Our pelts were stippled with the fretted shadows of the lace curtains, as if our skins were a mysterious uniform provided by the management in order to render all those who made love in that hotel anonymous. The mirror annihilated time, place and person. At the consecration of this house, the mirror had been dedicated to the reflection of chance embraces. Therefore, it treated flesh in an exemplary fashion, with charity and indifference. The mirror distilled the essence of all the encounters of strangers whose perceptions of one another existed only in the medium of the chance embrace, the accidental. During the durationless time we spent making love, we were not ourselves, whoever that might have been, but in some sense the ghosts of ourselves. But the selves we were not, the selves of our own habitual perceptions of ourselves, had a far more insubstantial substance than the reflection we were. The magic mirror presented me with a hitherto unconsidered notion of myself as I. Without any intention of mine, I had been defined by the action reflected in the mirror. I beset me. I was the subject of the sentence written on the mirror. I was not watching it. There was nothing whatsoever beyond the surface of the glass. Nothing kept me from the fact, the act. I had been precipitated into knowledge of the real conditions of living. Mirrors are ambiguous things. The bureaucracy of the mirror issues me with a passport to the world. It shows me my appearance. But what use is a passport to an armchair traveller? Women and mirrors are in complicity with one another to evade the action I slash she performs that she slash I cannot watch, the action with which I break out of the mirror, with which I assume my appearance. But this mirror refused to conspire with me. It was like the first mirror I'd ever seen. It reflected the embrace beneath it without the least guile. All it showed was inevitable, but I myself could never have dreamed it. I saw the flesh and the mirror, but I could not come to terms with the sight. My immediate response to it was to feel I'd acted out of character. 
The fancy dress disguise I'd put on to suit the city had betrayed me to a room and a bed and a modification of myself that had no business at all in my life, not in the life I had watched myself performing. Therefore, I evaded the mirror. I scrambled out of its arms and sat on the edge of the bed and lit a fresh cigarette from the butt of the old one. The rain beat down. My demonstration of perturbation was perfect in every detail, just like the movies. I applauded it. I was gratified. The mirror had not seduced me into behaving a way I would have felt inappropriate. That is, shrugging and sleeping, as though my infidelity was not of the least importance. I now shook with the disturbing presentiment that he, with his sequin eyes, who'd been kind to me, was an ironic substitute for the other one, the one I loved, as if the arbitrary carnival of the streets had gratuitously offered me this young man to find out if I could act out of character, and then projected our intersection upon the mirror as an objective lesson in the nature of things. Therefore, I dressed rapidly and ran away as soon as it was light outside, that mysterious colourless light of dawn when the hooded crows flap out of the temple groves to perch on the telegraph poles, cawing a baleful dawn chorus to the echoing boulevards, empty now of all the pleasure seekers. The rain had stopped. It was an overcast morning, so hot that I broke out into a sweat at the slightest movement. The bewildering electrographics of the city at night were all switched off. All the perspectives were pale, gritty grey. The air was full of dust. I never knew such a banal morning. The morning before the night before, the morning before this oppressive morning, I woke up in the cabin of a boat. All the previous day, as we rounded the coast in bright weather, I dreamed of the reunion before me, a lover's meeting refreshed by the three months I'd been gone, returning home due to a death in the family. I will come back as soon as I can. I'll write. Will you meet me at the pier? Of course, of course he will. But he was not at the pier. Where was he? So I went at once to the city and began my desolate tour of the pleasure quarters, looking for him in all the bars he used. He was nowhere to be found. I did not know his address, of course. He moved from rented room to rented room with the agility of the feckless, and we had corresponded through accommodation addresses, coffee shops, post restant, etc. Besides, there had been a displacement of mail reminiscent of the excesses of the 19th century novel, such as it is difficult to believe and could only have been caused by a desperate emotional necessity to cause as much confusion as possible. Both of us prided ourselves on our passionate sensibilities, of course. That was one thing we had in common. <laughs> so, although I thought I was the most romantic spectacle imaginable as I wandered weeping down the alleys, I was in reality at risk. I had fallen through one of the holes life leaves in it. These peculiar holes are the entrances to the counters at which you pay the price of the way you live. Random chance operatives in relation to these existential lacunae. One tumbles down them when, for the time being, due to hunger, despair, sleeplessness, hallucination, or those accidental on purpose misreadings of train timetables and airline schedules that produce margins of empty time, one is lost. One is at the mercy of events. That is why I like to be a foreigner. I only travel for insecurity, but I did not know that then. I found my self-imposed faint, my beloved, quite early that morning, but we quarrelled immediately. We quarrelled the day away assiduously and when I tried to pull the strings of myself and so take control of the situation, I was astonished to find the situation I wanted was disaster, shipwreck. I saw his face as though it were in ruins, although it was the sight in the world I knew best and the first time I saw it had not seemed to me a face I did not know. It had seemed, in some way, to correspond to my idea of my own face. It had seemed a face long known as well remembered, a face that had always been imminent in my consciousness as an idea that now found its first visual expression. So I suppose I do not know how he really looked and, in fact, 
I suppose I shall never know now. For he was plainly an object created in the mode of fantasy. His image was already present somewhere in my head, and I was seeking to discover it in actuality, looking at every face I met in case it was the right face. That is, the face which corresponded to my notion of the unseen face of the one I should love, a face created parthenogenetically by the rage to love which consumed me. So his self, and by his self I mean the, the thing he was to himself, was quite unknown to me. I created him solely in relation to myself, like a work of romantic art, an object corresponding to the ghost inside me. When I'd first loved him, I wanted to take him apart, as a child dismembers a clockwork toy, to comprehend the inscrutable mechanics of its interior. I wanted to see him far more naked than he was with his clothes off. It was easy enough to strip him bare, and then I picked up my scalpel and set to work. But since I was so absolutely in charge of the dissection, I only discovered what I was able to recognise already from past experience inside him. If ever I found anything new to me, I steadfastly ignored it. I was so absorbed in this work, it never occurred to me to wonder if it hurt him. In order to create the loved object in this way, and to issue it with its certificate of authentication as beloved, I had also to labour the idea of myself in love. I watched myself closely for all the signs and, Precisely upon cue, here they were. Longing, desire, self-abnegation, etc. I was racked by all the symptoms. Even so, in spite of this fugue of feeling, I had felt nothing but pleasure when the young man who picked me up inserted his sex inside me in the blue movie bedroom. I only grew guilty later when I realised I had not felt in the least guilty at the time. And was I in character when I felt guilty, or in character when I did not? I was perplexed. I no longer understood the logic of my own performance. My script had been scrambled behind my back. The cameraman was drunk. The director had had a crise de neuf and been taken away to a sanatorium. And my co-star had picked himself up off the operating table and painfully cobbled himself together again according to his own design. All of this had taken place while I was looking at the mirror. Imagine my affront. We quarrelled until night fell and, still quarrelling, found our way to another hotel. But this hotel and this night was in every respect a parody of the previous night. That's more like it. Squalor and humiliation. Here, there were no lace drapes, nor wind bells, nor moonlight, nor any moist whisper of lugubriously seductive rain. This place was bleak, mean and cheerless, and the sheets on the mattress they threw down on the floor for us were blotched with dirt, although at first we did not notice that because it was necessary to pretend the urgent passion we always used to feel in one another's presence, even if we felt it no longer, as if to act out the feeling with sufficient intensity would recreate it by sleight of hand, Although our skins, which knew us better than we knew ourselves, told us the period of reciprocation was over. It was a mean room, and the windows overlooked a parking lot with a freeway beyond it, so that the paper walls shuddered with the reverberations of the inferior clamour of the traffic. There was a sluggish electric fan with dead flies caught in the spokes, and a single strip of neon overhead lit us and everything up with a scarcely tolerable, quite remorseless light. A slatternly woman in a filthy apron brought us glasses of thin, cold brown tea made from barley, and then she shut the door on us. I would not let him kiss me between the thighs, because I was afraid he would taste the traces of last night's adventure. A little touch of paranoia in that delusion. I don't know how much guilt had to do with the choice of this decor but I felt it was perfectly appropriate. The air was thicker than tea that stewed on the hobble day, and cockroaches were running over the ceiling, I remember. I cried all the first part of the night. I cried until I was exhausted, but he turned on his side and slept. 
He saw through that ruse, though I did not, since I did not know that I was lying. But I could not sleep because of the rattling of the walls and the noise of the traffic. We had turned off the glaring lamp. When I saw a shaft of light fall across his face, I thought, surely it's too early for the dawn. But it was another person, silently sliding open the unlocked door in this disreputable hotel. Anything can happen. I screamed and the intruder vanished. Wakened by a scream, my lover thought that I'd gone mad and instantly trapped me in a stranglehold in case I murdered him. We were both old enough to have known better too. When I turned on the lamp to see what time it was, I noticed to my surprise that his features were blurring like the underwriting on a palimpsest. It wasn't long before we parted, only a few days. You can't keep that pace up for long. Then the city vanished. It ceased almost immediately to be a magic and appalling place. I woke up one morning and found it had become home. Though I still turn up my coat collar in a lonely way and I'm always looking at myself in mirrors, their only habits, and give no clue at all to my character, whatever it is. The most difficult performance in the world is acting naturally, isn't it? Everything else is artful.